well, without further ado, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending uh, the graveyard shift. But uh, yeah, we're very pleased to be uh, on the stage and yeah, representing at Groundswell the the hemp industry. So we've got various different um, industry players. Um, we've got yeah, some really good um, yeah, interesting talks. I think some some slides, and we'll have a, a little discussion and take some questions at the end. My name is Nathaniel Luxley. Uh, I am director of the British Hemp Alliance. We are a multi-stakeholder environmental organisation, um, not for profit, and we are working with various different uh, research organisations and creating a knowledge hub. Um, so working to open up uh, the industry and farming, um, encouraging new entrants to, to grow hemp and uh, make information available uh, which isn't out there at the moment. So there's uh, a certain challenges with the industry, which we'll touch on. Um, and I think, yeah, we've got some really good experience on stage today. Um, so yeah, just uh, to mention that there's a, a new project starting, uh, which has just started. Uh, it's a four year project, which is investigating uh, high carbon cropping, which hemp is one uh, of many different systems being looked at. So it's really exciting to uh, yeah be a part of that. Um, looking at kind of developing soil testing protocols and all the way down to value chain um, and yeah uh, various different elements. So much more to come from that. But uh, without further ado, I'll uh, pass it over to Nick. Nick Clay. Hello. Hello. Um, so first, first of all, you're going to see. Uh, a video that's been put together and some of it's on our website. It gives you a brief outline of uh, how we harvest this quite remarkably tall crop. Um, we s we're sowing hemp in May and hopefully by first, second week of August we can be 12 feet tall. Um, so we we've had to build this cutter, we're actually building another one at the moment. Uh, to enable us to chop the plant into shorter lengths so so it will in fact bale and then go through our whole decortication process um, we started growing hemp in 2002 and it's gradually sort of taken over my life uh, um, it, the, there isn't there isn't a day goes past where we don't try and think of another way of making things easier better better quality um, and, and it all starts at this point here so as we saw on the video it was cut and then we run through with a tether um, main reason is to turn it over and knock the leaf off because we aren't allowed to harvest leaf that's part of the uh, one of the home office regulations um, and then after four to six weeks we put it in a bale store it in a shed then for the whole of the rest of the year we put it through a vast array of machinery to create yeah, the woody core into either horse bedding or um, for Hadley here to build houses with. The fibre which is 25% of the crop it's going into th things like loft insulation. I've also got uh, a denim jacket there that is made with 30% hemp. Fuel for Wood log burning stoves made out of all our waste. What else have we got? Yeah, that's that's cottonized hemp fiber. If anyone would like a look, pass that round. And we've also got hemp wool fabrics that are made in Yorkshire. So it's uh, it's been used for a vast vast array of things. Oh, and then yeah, this one at the back. Uh, that's a non-woven mat, and the bio composites yeah bio composites companies are making. Uh, replacing carbon fibres with a hemp fibre, so there is there is a tremendous amount of work going on to to utilise this crop. Hello, my name's Hadley. I'm from Wellspring. Um, I'm based in South Wales, but I was actually born just down the road from here in Harlow. So it's nice to be back. Um, so our company, we're a construction business and we're about developing systems and services for climate positive construction. Um, 
so the way we do that is through three things. We've um, getting involved with materials and primarily hemp. I'd only heard about hemp three years ago. Um, I'm a structural engineer by trade and looking across the opportunities within this space in terms of delivering the future housing for the UK. Um, personally, I think hemp's the solution for different reasons. Um, Wellspring property, so we're delivering housing currently in South Wales. Um, and then we've also got a services business, which is about um, delivering sustainable construction at scale and all of the stuff that goes into that in terms of de-risking um, and accelerating innovation within construction in the built environment. And that's not working. All right, bud. There we go. So um, currently we've got two sites that we've been involved with in South Wales. So we work in the valleys of South Wales. Um, so the first house that we built was in Clumvy Court in my stake. There we go. So that's what it um, looked like before we built it online. Um, it's just won an award for the Insider Property Awards. Um, and this is what it looks like in construction. So you can see there that it's the external walls that we're building out of hemp. Um, and this is what it looks like. So this is the shiv that Nick was talking about. The, it's basically the woody part of the stalk that gets chopped up in the field, mixed with a lime binder, and goes into creating a solid wall construction method. So um, there's many ways of building with hemp, but this is one of the ones that we're using at the moment. Um, and in terms of the works we had to do, we had to get all of the build regulations, build warranty approval so that it could be used um, and sold with a normal commercial mortgage. And we did that on this property. So Nationwide um, Building Society lent against this house, which for us was brilliant because it proves the concept. Um, one of the biggest high street lenders offering a mortgage on a hemp house. Um, that's what it looked like at the finished stage. And it was really important for us that it looked exactly the same as any other building in that area because um, we wanted to move away from hemp being in the space of perhaps eco homes and um, that sort of thing um, to show that it's scalable and it's realistic as a solution. That's what it looks like inside and you can probably not tell which wall's hemp and which isn't. And again, that was a really important part. Um, in terms of living in a hemp building, the benefits to the person are absolutely massive. It's breathable, so it deals with internal moisture. You don't get the build-up of condensation and therefore you don't get the associated mould growth. So in places like the South Wales Valley where black mould's a massive issue, this is a really affordable and scalable solution. The team that we built it with was local bricklayers down the road. Um, and within a day or two, you can be trained to build with this stuff, which is also really important in terms of talking about actually accessing mass housing in the UK. Um, there's a million other benefits, which if you look at our website or any of the guys here, you'll see um, in terms of locking up carbon better than net zero, that sort of thing. Um, this is our current site we're on, which is Pearson Way in Neath, and this is eight houses now. So... That last one was a bit of an exec type house. This is more of your typical four bed detached and four and two bed semi. Um, and we built our site office out of hemp on this one. So that's up now. Um, and part of that's just marketing, basically getting people from um, banks through to housing associations into a hemp space so that they, a lot of the risks that you're talking about with this type of construction, they're not real risks. They're just people in insurance who don't understand construction. And so getting someone in a room where it's been built and saying this is what it looks like and this is why water's not going to get through the wall is a massive plus. Um, we're about halfway through this project now, so we'll have eight houses coming on the market next month and they'll be delivered um, before the summer next year. And we're just involved with getting our third site delivered for the end of the year. As a part of this journey, we've also, because the beginning aim was to um, really revolution well sort of innovate construction um and realizing as we were doing it that a large part of that is going to be to do with the materials and the actual marketability and the scalability of them so we've just begun to grow hemp in west wales um with the purpose of proving that you can do this locally um and adding into the story of the fact that 
there's not many people in the country who are building a house that they've grown 20 miles down the road affordably as cheap as you can build any other type of construction in that part of the UK um, and this is part of the journey that we're just kind of exploring and getting into um, but I think is again a massive part of the solution of really delivering the future of housing in the UK um, yeah that's us Hi, uh, my name's Steve Glover, and can you do that a bit? Because there's only four slides, so you may as well do it. Because uh, oh, I don't know how to do it. So I run a company called UK Hemp, and five years ago, f six years ago, I was working in commercial horticulture. So I was growing herbs and salads for restaurants, and, you know, they had a three-day shelf life, and, you know, I had to drill three times a week, and there was, you know what I mean, there's loads of drama refrigerated you know like literally three day shelf life is really difficult to deal with uh, but I was always interested in hemp and uh, the company that I was working for specialised in looking after people with addiction problems right so people with criminal backgrounds people with addiction problems and um, and I got a license for them to grow hemp right and then and that kind of started the journey of, of the journey that we're on at the moment uh, and what we're doing now is uh, now we have 17 farmers growing over a total of 170 hectares uh, and we grow for seed. So we grow for seed for nutrition and that nutrition is for human nutrition and animal nutrition. Uh, in terms of our ability to be able to produce p protein, uh, per hectare we produce around 400 kilos of protein per hectare, whereas beef produces around six kilos of protein per hectare. So it's a very good uh, return on uh, land use for you know keeping people fed. And the protein is also an extremely good protein, uh, very easily digested by humans and uh, other mammals. Uh, but we also grow, and it's got an am amazing amino acid profile, so it is, in fact, a complete food uh, in terms of protein. And it also, uh, the oil then is um, a really good source of essential fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, perfect ratios. And so, uh, and so, so the products that we make is hemp protein powder, hemp seed oil, uh, cold pressed, um, a hulled seed where we just take the shells off, and uh, and a fibre product, um, and we do that in Warminster, and we produce around I don't know 150 tons per year. Uh, the 17 different growers you know fluctuate sometimes some of them will grow and then others won't and then new ones will come on but the interest from farmers is just is just phenomenal we'd we'd have probably five or six five or six inquiries proper legitimate inquiries per week at the moment so loads of people want to grow it and it's really nice to be uh w you know us guys all working together people ladies men all working together to uh to help the industry grow because it's what needs to, it's what really needs to happen um, can you change the slide over? So that's, uh, yeah, we've won a couple of awards and we're in 180 shops nationwide. We sell into uh, food manufacturers, cosmetic manufacturers, animal feed manufacturers. Uh, yeah, that's about it really, I think. That's the, l that's the products there. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's about it. you Andy. Uh, hello my name's uh, Andrew Jones I don't have any slides um, so let me just talk to you a little bit about a company we founded called Fibra. Um, we founded it uh, four years ago uh, we were looking at uh, various different challenges uh, in agriculture um, mainly around break crops uh, we've got a farm in, in North Wiltshire a mixed farm um, where we grow arable we've got grass and sheep um, the the, the challenge around uh, break crops for, for farmers as agricultural chemistry has changed over the last um, sort of five to ten years uh, leaves farmers with a, a significant dilemma around the traditional break crops that they've been growing, things like oilseed, rape, um, beans, peas. Um, the traditional break crops, as the chemistry has disappeared, things like neonicotinoids being removed um, from license, um, the inability to challenge things like flea beetle, uh, means that as a, as a crop it's a it's a real challenge for for farmers so hemp was 
was a was an area that I looked quite uh, quite closely at to begin with, and then I started to understand more and more how we may be able to use the crop. So as farmers, obviously you want to grow something that you can um, you can sell. Uh, you need to be able to do uh, the work that a break crop is supposed to do, help regenerate the soil, prepare the soil for um, production the following year. Um, so we spent a lot of time uh, on the farm experimenting with with various uh, tillage techniques, uh, various seed rates, um, various inputs. Um, the, the, the reality for it as a, as a crop for farmers is that obviously it's very, very low input. Uh, we grow it on the farm with absolutely no uh, nitrogen uh, additions whatsoever. There's no pesticide profile um, required. There's no pests uh, currently in the UK um, that uh, that will that will uh, will forage on it apart from hares uh, we're finding um, just and, and pigeons, uh, which is the the perennial problem for any early stage uh, crop. So as a, as a as a crop, it's absolutely fantastic. You effectively drill it late May, so you can get uh, sorry late April, early May. Uh, so you can get beyond the bad weather. Spring cropping, as everyone will know, uh, is becoming increasingly challenging in the UK with the, the movement of, of season, the growing seasons, the lengthening of the, the later season, the shortening of the earlier one. So farmers who struggle with heavier ground um, are now growing it uh, very, very successfully. As we started to uh, look at the supply chain for hemp and where it was going to go, uh, we realised that there were there's very, very few opportunities for, for farmers beyond sort of the, 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 the radius of, of, say, Nick in East Yorkshire, who has a processor, there's just very few processing facilities. Um, there's one um, a little bit further south from you, um, uh, Tadcaster uh, in York, um, and there's uh, an experimental uh, one, a very, very old machine uh, in Leicestershire. Um, so we started to think about how we bridge the gap between production and um, manufacturers. So we're building a, um, a new processing facility near Cheltenham um, with, a, with, a, with a very uh, helpful farmer, frankly, who's growing um, about 40 hectares uh, of hemp for us um, as, a, as a trial in his arable uh, rotation. Um, we're putting the uh, processor actually in, a, in an old grain silo uh, that, uh, that he's not going to use anymore because he's obviously growing uh, more hemp and less, less grains uh, this year. Um, and see how that how that progresses. We've been working um, with um, a few different manufacturers, uh, ideating products in automotive um, and in healthcare. Um, the reality for the healthcare industry uh, is they use an awful lot of cotton. Um, the reality for them is that they're desperately trying to move away from that. It comes an awfully long way. Um, generally speaking, uh, it's very very difficult to truly understand uh, the provenance. It's often tainted by um, bonded labour, uh, high use of pesticides, water usage, um, etc. So we're working uh, with a company uh, in Bristol, um, ideating and creating uh, healthcare products and hygiene products, and we've got a, a grant from UK Innovate um, to help develop that. Um, also in automotive, uh, we're working with a company up in Banbury, who's working with a, a major OEM, uh, who we don't know who they are, uh, who are looking at automotive production. Uh, in the UK, assembly and construction using UK-grown uh, natural fibre, both flax um, and hemp. And then we've got the construction industry, um, as represented um, by Hadley. Um, again, the, the opportunity there with his company, with people like Hemspan, um, to actually build houses, build houses at scale um, using the material um, is, uh, is, 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 is extremely important. And I think that probably the last, uh, maybe people see hemp, been much more in a sort of a climate perspective the reality is that it's uh, an incredibly efficient um, sequester of both um, atmospheric and soil carbon um, I think that the, the the reality is that farmers are desperately needing to build their carbon balance sheet um, to offset um, their um, methods of cultivation um, etc I think that um, the only way that the the UK can get anywhere near delivering on its net zero uh, promises is to start effectively sequestering carbon and putting the product uh, into manufactured goods um, in construction, in auto, in healthcare. Um, our ability, I think, to to deliver on those uh, on those goals is is uh, I think is intimately linked to crops that sequester carbon at at, at an appropriate rate. Um, in terms of 
the research that's going on, which Nathaniel uh, mentioned um, earlier on, NIAB uh, have just launched a project with a number of industry players from the seeds all the way uh, up to uh, manufacturers. Uh, it's an important project because I think people realize the, um, the anecdotal evidence around, around hemp is, is compelling, but the reality for farmers, the reality for a manufacturer is that they need empirical evidence. Um, and if you're going to change the materials that you use in manufacturing or you're going to change your crop rotation, you need to know that the crop that you're going to grow or the raw materials you're going to use are going to be there and they're going to be produced uh, at scale for an appropriate period of time. Um, so that's our perspective at, at, at Fibra and we're looking forward to opening our plant um, at, in, uh, in September. Well said. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, you are allowed to whoop for some of this because there's some amazing stuff that's, you know, clapping's allowed too. Cause <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my name's Sam. I'm from uh, Industrial Nature. And uh, there you go. Um, and we make some of this. If you could throw that around, Matt. As long as it comes back to the stage. <laughs> there we go. Um, we're uh, now making materials from industrial hemp, flax, bio-based sources. Um, we are, um, at the minute, producing uh, UK grown and made, um, high performance, low carbon and circular building materials for exactly the houses that Hadley was just talking about. Um, and we take Yorkshire's finest industrial hemp from Nick, uh, <laughs> uh, who's been growing it for 21 years. That deserves a whoop for a start. <laughs> so if you, if you need to find something out, ask him. Um, but it's cracking, cracking industrial hemp, and we bring it up to the Scottish borders where, where we're based. We're an Edinburgh-based innovation company. Um, we're here because we've got a planet to cool, and hemp is one of the solutions we need for the future. And as the guys have been saying, we need to make sure that we have all of this joined up, from the seed to the growers to the processing to the manufacturers like us putting in place the manufacturing facilities, um, to then the guys who are building the houses, Hempspan uh, and Hadley and other developers with all the right quality marks and certifications that, that allow us to open up these markets. Um, we're establishing the Scottish Borders, which is a region, if, if you know it at all, um, fantastic textiles heritage, great manufacturing heritage, but has been decimated by the International Division of Labor. All the kit that we needed has gone to China. There's none of it left. So we've been putting in place the equipment that's required to make this material again for the first time. And we're creating rural jobs again in the Scottish Borders. So if you Google industrial nature, You'll find us, but or indie nature, you'll find us, but industrial nature also you get lots of pictures of old industrial sites being regrown by nature. And that was what we were all about, is it's not just about the planet, it's about the people in those locations and repurposing a whole natural industrial revolution, which hemp is part of. And really we're relearning the skills of how to work with this material and getting the right equipment. I'm blown away, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but how engineering and, and crops can turn into thermal performance in a building that nails it and can compete with glass walls and things like that. We're a bit behind those guys, but we're catching up fast. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be part of that, uh, of that regrowth. In Europe, they're ahead of us. And we've just established the site that you can see on the screen now. Um, massive facility, 40,000 square foot facility with non-woven textiles line to be able to work with the fibers, natural fibers, and turn them into really high quality materials. So we established that and opened the doors on that in October of last year and are now supplying into the market. We're going through the certifications right now to be able to really supply at scale. So by this autumn, we should be uh, really shifting in construction. So what you see there is shed loads of uh, hemp, hemp insulation bats and boards and things like that. And here we are in the beautiful Scottish borders. That's the, the facility. Uh, you're welcome to come and come and visit. Um, Talking about this, th so if you look into Europe, natural fibers, wood fiber, and so on, that's been going gangbusters for about 20 odd years. They have invested well in European development funds. Um, industrial hemp is managed just like any other crop. Here, it's managed by home office licensing, for example, which really controls the supply. So we need DEFRA really in, in that game, and, and we can shift the dial. We've just put in the high capacity line in, in the Scottish borders. Um, there's other sheep wool, uh, natural fiber being processed down south for mattresses mostly, some insulation as well. Um, but there's, there's plenty of space in the UK. We need, we need a lot more of these facilities if we're actually to supply it at scale. It's taken seven years for us to get to this point. My co-founder Scott was studying at CAT in Wales at the Centre for Alternative Technology, working with fuel poverty, changing the f uh, fabric first mindset of what we're building buildings with. 
he found Nick and, and has been starting to really use his fibers ever since. And a big thank you to the development capital from people like Scottish National Investment Bank who've help, helped to take that long-term view that says, right, we need the infrastructure here to shift and allow farms to farm and have people to be able to sell it to into these end markets. Um, so we all know it's carbon is a big issue, but it's also all this material is going to landfill, this linear economy, we need to get rid of that and industrial hemp is, is part of that solution. Um, I'll skip on quickly, but a renewable resource, fast, it's net carbon storage. Even when it's leaving our gate, we're still carbon negative. Even in landfill, um, we're, 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 we're positive. It's circular, we can reprocess this stuff and, it, and it's inert as well. So um, in terms of net carbon, it's a no-brainer. New build housing um, has, has got massive pressure on it to reduce the amount of embodied carbon in its buildings, not just the operational carbon of a building through its life course. So by using hemp, you're avoiding the use of that carbon. You're actually capturing the carbon and sticking it in your loft or in your walls or in your floors. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, a really important um, journey. And how we compete, uh, it's important that the carbon is understood for those house builders to be able to calculate their scope one, two, and three carbon emissions. We have to get this supply chain really right. So it's an exciting time in, in the industry. I'll skip on quickly, but if you, if you Google us, um, if you're doing if you're topping up with your loft, get some hemp in there and feel good about it. Um, it can be used for all sorts of applications, um, not just that. Um, I'll move on quickly. Loads of benefits to it as well. Um, so if you follow, follow us on LinkedIn, you'll find all about, all about that. The passive house or retrofits. Um, hemp, a traditional crop in the UK, um, in 1650, we would all have been farming a bit of hemp as part of mandate from the king for the rip ropes and the rigging for the navy and so on. Um, the last hundred years has been a bit of a hundred year blip, but as a traditional crop for traditional buildings, the breathability in, in hemp is fantastic uh, and it doesn't have some of the issues of other natural fibers um, as well. Um, but it's really good to work with. Um, you wouldn't be passing around a bit of glass wool for everybody to you know, touch and feel and rub against the face. You just wouldn't do it. Um, but we're outperforming it in many different um, locations. So people often talk about fire, hemp, and other natural fibers have got really good fire properties as well. They're, they're a natural fiber, they, they smolder really slowly when, when exposed to fire, and um, they have best-in-class smoke ratings and things like that. So it's not toxic smoke, it's not the, the, uh, the, the, the black uh, toxic smoke at all. And I need to find a way about talking about um, no flaming droplets as being a thing. I'm trying to find a way of framing it. but. Um, we do need to change mindsets, change marketing, change how we cut materials, all that sort of stuff, and get installers trained up and get the specifiers able to buy this. But there's a fantastic range of other markets, uh, from automotive to bedding, furniture, mattresses, that sort of stuff. Changing those mindsets in certification bodies, that's all happening quite rapidly, especially in response to, to climate change. So I'm about done. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of, uh, bunch of questions, but uh, it's an exciting time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. That was uh, yeah, very uh, very impressive, and I think the the amount of uh, support and you know, fundraising that you've done is really uh, quite impressive. Um, there are a lot of challenges in the industry, and that stigma um, is a is a big part of it. Um, being able to to raise funding and investment has been a a challenge. I think everyone's faced, <laughs> um, and that's uh, yeah. Hopefully, the landscape is changing somewhat. Um, yeah, wish wish you all the luck. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously part of this discussion is based on the practicalities of growing uh, and bringing hemp products to market. Uh, obviously, Nick has uh, by far the most experience on, on this stage. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> over to you in terms of uh, if you were to uh, recommend or, or make any uh, kind of uh, give, it, give any advice to new budding hemp growers, uh, do you have any, uh, any pearls of wisdom that you might be able to share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you if you are interested in growing hemp, then um, I suppose the first thing is don't it's 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 a really robust crop once it gets going. It's the the first two weeks while it's coming out the ground and the the little coleoptile that breaks off as soon as the wind blows at it or a pigeon pecks it off or anything like that. It's the and that's the key to it. It's the establishment, really. And then the, once it's established, it will pretty much look after itself. It hasn't got a big demand for water. It's very deep rooting, um, and it likes sunshine. So 
June, the second half of June's been quite good for it. The first half of May and the first half of June with uh, with the east wind, it was extremely cold and grew badly, but it's it's starting to grow now. I have some, uh, I was in on Friday that's six feet tall, and that was sown on the 1st of May. That's, that's uh, yeah, that is impressive. I mean, uh, obviously there, there are various different challenges, in including uh, application for a license and the whole process, which uh, could take uh, many hours of discussion. So I don't think we're gonna <laughs> touch on that too much, um, but I think everyone, again, um, sees that there, there's room for improvement in that process. I think the kind of administration of the, the licenses uh, certainly needs some work and whether we can actually remove that process and um, yeah, encourage more growers, um, I think that would, would certainly obviously give a boost. Um, challenges obviously to, to the actual crop, it's very resilient as a, as a plant, um, grows yeah, Siberia to South Africa and anywhere in between really, but um, Steve, have you, obviously there's challenges with um, the crop, sometimes varieties such as uh, Fanola, for example, is quite um, reliant on water. So I know the drought in the last couple of years has been yeah. a bit of a hit. Yeah, we, we, um, last year we we had a good year. I mean, like we 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 distribute Fanola and Henola and Bilibreski. Bilibreski is a fibre crop, which, which some people are growing this year. Uh, but we we over the 170 hectares of Fanola that we grow. We're growing from uh, Totnes to Aberdeen, from West Wales to Norfolk. Uh, last year, after after people drilled in in uh, mid May, uh, not one drop of water on the crop until we harvested, and we had a good yield. So, like, it it, it dealt with those drought conditions re really quite uh, surprisingly well, right? This year is n is different. It's it's dr it's it's strange because we had we had a wetter spring, but it's it's drier and hotter, and it's growing slowly this year, and it just goes to show, you know, what I mean, we, it may be too late, you know, what I mean, it may be that it's the 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 climate has changed to such a degree that it's going to be really hard to grow. Uh, it's l almost as if we've got a monsoon type pattern that's happening in 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 the UK these days. And so I think I think the challenge is 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 developing crops that can handle the conditions that we've got because the conditions are definitely changing. There's no two ways about it. Uh, absolutely. <coughs> I mean, it's as as Andy was saying, Andrew's uh, touching on the the fact that as a break crop, it's uh, incredible kind of breaking up that soil, that compacted soil, um, kind of yes, locking in nutrients. The the amount, the huge huge root structure. Uh, leaves a significant amount of carbon in the soil, but also encourages that biodiversity. So th that's really exciting to see that kind of developing. Um, obviously, the U UK Climate Change Committee have recently had some scathing, uh, scathing feedback on the government's uh, lack of uh, action. Um, Andrew, uh, do you do you think uh, hemp could be a, a good good crop uh, for for farmers to integrate? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the the reality is our experience of it so far um, has been it's been very straightforward to grow. I think the only thing that it doesn't like is compacted ground, really compacted ground. Um, we've used lots of different tillage uh, techniques. We do on our farm generally because we have lots of different kinds of soils uh, to deal with. So we we min till some areas, we deep plow uh, others uh, to ensure that the, the crops that we're growing uh, get the best possible start. Um, We've we found and I, we've given assurances to the farmers that are growing it for us and their direct experience has been it's been it's been easy to establish. To Nick's point, it is it is a fragile crop early on, as many things are, yeah. uh, to be honest. Um, but once it's up and away, it just outcompetes absolutely everything. So that the fact that there's no need for any herbicides or any insecticides uh, whatsoever, we think is an, is an enormous benefit not only from an ecological perspective but also from a financial perspective so you know we think that uh for farmers to grow this if you can if you can get them to think about it in terms of a, a serial outcome in terms of gross yield uh gross margin sorry uh you should think about it around 500 pounds uh, a hectare um for those that are, are thinking about what what are the economics look like for me um i think that really comes from the fact that you are carrying out very very few operations 
uh, in the field, so you're burning less diesel, you're buying less spray, or you're buying any spray, uh, you know, no FERT, uh, unless you really want to start to build biomass. We have a constant debate uh, with the go guys that are growing it for us who are, you know, they're, they're almost conditioned to use um, um, manufactured nitrogen. Uh, so getting them not to put nitrogen on something is very, very hard. Uh, but they are experiencing very positive outcomes when they're not using it. So it tends to build biomass rather than fibre, we've, we've found. Um, Nick, um, it would be interesting to get your perspective on that, actually. I don't know how you, uh, you treat it from a nutrient perspective. Um, well, from a nutrient perspective, we've done everything from growing without any uh, bag fertiliser, putting um, just, just using pig manure. Uh, we've put nitrogen fixing cover crops in straight after wheat harvest because you can then you've got all until April to uh, to let them do the thing um, we've used bag nitrogen yep. and my yeah as long as it's got enough nutrition wherever it comes from it's gonna do it's gonna do yep. well uh, you can't grow it without anything yep. uh, nothing will grow without any nutrient in um, so yeah uh, the biggest crop that we've ever cut was 14 foot six tall and that was grown next to a pig unit and it got mucked every time that their slurry tank was full so it just <laughs> so it likes it likes fit soil and it'll just it, it will grow tremendously fantastic i think yeah this this whole event obviously ground soil is a melting pot for kind of how how to feel feed that soil and, and kind of build that resilience and and yeah how, how you get the most out of uh, those crops um obviously yeah the, the built environment is a huge emission for uh, uh Net zero, uh, forty percent overall. I think globally, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's a, it's a huge, huge mountain we got to climb. Um, yeah, hats off to you both, you guys, for uh, trying to tackle that. I think um, Sam, yeah, kind of reducing emissions, uh, manufacturing in the UK. There's a lot of challenges that you're, you're facing. I mean, um, yeah, how do you how do you manage it? That's, that's a good question. Um, f fundamentally. You know, with with climate change and so on, as you say, we we don't have time for this. <laughs> you know, we need more. Is anybody farming hemp at the minute? Excellent, fantastic. Grow more of it, please. And anybody else, if you're not, please start because we need more. And anybody processing hemp? No, it's only Nick and a couple of others. <laughs> we need more of that too. Um, f for manufacturing, for, for in construction, you know, the, it's a one billion pound market construction installation in the UK alone. You know, it's it's massive. It's it's a it's a big big prize to to change that if we can get it changed. But it takes so long to get to get that done. Um, we we're looking at replicating what we do. We have built for replication into other locations. So looking for partners to replicate local manufacturing to work with folks that are already farming and processing and folks that are already building building buildings. Um, we're looking at ways of sharing our model quicker because it takes so long. Certification of each product. You know, you're looking at anything from six months if you're lucky to 18 months if you're not or more some people just quit because they can't afford to keep going while they're waiting for something to be certified so it it takes a while to unlock some of these markets so um, uh, we have to build on each other's success and, and wins I think um, and also diversify and make sure we can spread uh, into different different markets but there's lots going on around carbon and buildings at the minute hemp has got a big big role to play in that um, it's now carbon. So all this offsetting schemes that are trying to push you, if you take it one flight and plant a bunch of trees, it's going to take you a few years to have got that flight offset. So anybody that's thinking we can keep on business as usual and just offset it into the future, hemp is now. It's, it's this year, you know, and, and you, can s you can sequester straight away or avoid making those emissions in the first place. So getting those um, arguments across is, is really tricky, um, but it's, it does take a long time to get this sort of stuff in place um, the more we learn the more facilities we get we've got a whole new revolution of of, uh, uh, of industry coming so it's pretty exciting um, anybody up for a hemp house just quick yeah yeah <laughs> bloody gorgeous absolutely sorry nix is lovely as well if you get a chance <laughs> Abs absolutely i think yeah you hit, hit the nail on the head there um and th there are so many kind of stacked benefits for hemp talk about kind of public goods and all this talk from defra about environmental land management scheme hemp uh, as a crop it can tick a lot of those boxes the biodiversity net gain all of these elements um we're not going to go into the barriers like i say there's <laughs> it's a whole 
whole other kind of politics of it, unfortunately, is uh, is, is holding things back. But Hadley, uh, you, you mentioned kind of having a uh, a local supply of hemp to construct local buildings, local residential houses. I know you're you're in talks with local government in Wales. Um, how how do you think like the the kind of broad spectrum of benefits kind of comes through with hemp? Yeah, I think um, from my perspective, I'm absolutely sold on hemp being the solution for housing. Everything low rise right now could be delivered in hemp. And one of the big reasons for this is the scalability of it. If we're talking about um, delivering healthy net zero homes, you're pretty much talking about mass timber or crops and the land mass required to deliver the amount of new build housing that's still necessary um, in the UK through timber is just astronomical and removing forests is really bad for biodiversity. Whereas with hemp, you're delivering a crop in four months. You know, one of the great things I love about it is from a construction point of view, my quality assurance with hemp is minimal. I just need a crop that grows as quick as possible, as high as possible, and it's going to be good enough quality for what I want to do. Um, and I think it's also about the human element because when we talk about sustainability, it's what we're we talking about. We're talking about the planet, but we're also talking about people. And, you know, there's a whole industry of people who are in construction. And some of the solutions just that get put out there are just going to wipe out tens of thousands of jobs. I literally could take all of the bricklayers in Hertfordshire and Essex tomorrow, put them through a course, get enough material from these guys, and within two months we would be building housing that's healthier for you, better for the environment, um, locks up carbon. You know, we locked up nine tons of carbon in that house. and. I think one of the challenges in this space is that we think, like Sam's saying, that we've gone past the point where we need to be doing this. You know, that conversation's over. It's like you need to do it now. I was in a, a housing conference in Wales at, in December, and there's this guy from Oxford doing a PhD who basically presented the fact that the amount of carbon that housing is emitting, even with all of the government strategies to date, housing on its own is going to knock us beyond this net zero target. It's physically impossible. So I, I look across my industry and I don't see loads of decent solutions. This is one of the few ones. Um, and I think a lot of it, hemp becoming what it needs to be, is about speed of getting this stuff delivered. You know, there's houses that are built there that have been around for 20 odd years. Nick's house is 15 years old. This isn't new technology. It's not my technology. It's technology that's been around for a long time. The data is all out there. All we did was go on a website and find the information that was public information and put it into a document. And all of the people that control the industry with insurances and mortgages, they shut up the minute you show them that there's actual evidence for why this is better. And I think things are changing because more and more people are realizing this is the time, this is the moment. This is when we've got to engage with this stuff, and that means delivering it now. Totally, um, and that's uh, that's the voice of a, a new newcomer to building uh, award winner. I think was it <laughs> last week? Uh, no, absolutely incredible. Um, and Steve, uh, I know you've been working hard on getting um, up to ISO standards for your your facility. Do you think kind of the uh, the, the food industry? requires those kind of specifications is is it are you getting a different conversation from the kind of mass retail uh, these days do you think um the uh it's 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 extremely difficult to change two things about people and one is what they eat and the other is what they spend on what they eat and so while we are replacing existing products with say for, for instance with our hemp seed oil we can replace fish oil, right? We've got the same kind of fatty acid profile as fish oil. Uh, and, but it, we can never compete on, on in terms of price with these massive industries that, you know, make fish oil. You know I mean? There's absolutely no way. So the, the, the challenge really is that uh, we don't want hemp products to be a niche product that only uh, wealthy people can afford. We want it to be a, a ubiquitously available throughout the whole uh, social stratas really um, because it's so good for you uh, so getting getting the <laughs> getting the uh, getting the material in front of people at the right price 
is a challenge. Um, but but you know what I mean? We're only in our fourth year of growing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, think we're reasonably priced. We think we've got a pretty good um, uh, accreditation, but we are always looking what is the next accreditation that we need in order to be able to get further into the uh, uh, retail industry. You know, so yeah, it's an on it's an ongoing work. You know, the same as these guys. Every every everything's developing. You know, I mean, nobody sits there going, "Oh, I've got it sus now. I don't need to do any more development." You know, we're all we're all pushing away to see how we can make it better, cheaper. You know. Yeah, Abs absolutely. I think yeah, you've that that uh, accessibility and kind of building some resilience into the food supply chain, being able yep. to grow uh, a really fantastic crop and and feed. New high high nutrition yeah um, uh, the problem is really the problem is that we're competing against systems that have been put in place for you know y years and years and years you know, a really good example is soy protein soy protein 60 percent 300 quid a ton hemp protein 50 percent protein nine grand a ton you know so there's a lot of work to be done but you know you can eat soy protein people say you know you might develop growths you know, I mean, it has to be imported from South America. It's likely to be genetically modified. You know, it's the same as what you guys are saying about the buildings. You know what I mean? You know, if you're baking your building out of something that's that's hemp, you know it's clean. And you know, if you're if you're eating hemp, you know that that's clean. So, I mean, there's a lot of kind of crossovers between what you guys are doing and what we're doing. And it's, I think, it's that kind of in innovation. Even though it's uh, this this ancient crop and food source and mm. source of fiber and clothing for for many many centuries. Um, we we have a, a variety of kind of modern day issues that we can uh, yeah. hemp can help help to kind of solve, um, but that takes innovation. It takes like joined joined up thinking and collaboration. Uh, I know Andrew, you've been working a hell of a lot of uh, research going into that kind of vi value chain and understanding um, where best to kind of um, yeah what what the good opportunities are, how to scale. Um, can you talk talk a bit on that and maybe some of the risks involved? Um, or inherent risks and yeah so it, the so for our our model is is essentially to have a uh, a processor in a location and recruit farmers within a 50 kilometer radius uh, of the location there's a, a number of reasons for that one uh transporting straw uh is 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 expensive it's too light it's does you don't get much on a truck um etc um it also means that you get uh, a support for rural economies you create local jobs um, often in rural economies now, jobs jobs are continuing to be to be lost either through automation or just loss um, loss of uh, places of work as people have uh, increasingly urbanised uh, and moved to uh, move to cities. Um, and just to provide people with an income so that they can live uh, where they grew where they grew up, uh, which um, you know, being from a rural part of Devon, I can tell you, was always a uh, a challenge, and very very few people ever hung around once they'd once they'd left school. Um, the 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 interesting thing about the the model is that generally speaking, you can our processors will handle sort of eight to ten thousand tons um, a uh, uh, a year. It means that you can in that land area you can build production um, into a into a, a into a into an arable rotation um, and make sure that you've got that continual uh, supply going through the the processor. Um, as we've looked at um, supply chains, um, the focus of manufacturers in particular of trying to break down the barriers that have been created in supply chains uh, since 2000 um, and, uh, and, and 16, well not since 2016, but since Brexit, uh, has left people um, looking at a constant supply uh, onshore just in time. Now, in the UK, we are extremely good at growing crops. There is a, there's absolutely no debate about that. We can grow a fibre crop, and whether that is flax, whether it's hemp, whatever it might be, flax has its own uh, challenges. But for hemp, um, the farming techniques that, that we use, the machinery that farmers use, Nick has um, innovated massively, uh, both in terms of processing and in terms of harvest technology. So you know, we, we're in a position to, to, to share that with people that want to that wanna farm and want to wanna just supply more hemp uh, to the market. The local production side is becoming increasingly uh, important. So on the automotive side, um, obviously there's a gigafactory being built uh, in Somerset uh, by Tata. Um, there will be an associated, not, not a Tata factory, uh, but another man motor manufacturer 
will uh, will construct cars uh, not too far from there in the not too distant future. They're extremely interested in trying to find a local supply of onsh onshore and local supply uh, of natural fiber for them to blend with synthetic fibers so they can just improve the carbon footprint of the car itself. In fact, they've already patented grown in the UK uh, for their cars. Um, which is uh, which is fascinating. So the commitment is there from industry if we can just supply what they what they want um, and to move people from doing you know a traditional uh, rotation, including uh, hemp. It's not a it's not a big leap, but you know it does take a change in 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 mindset um, because you know th there's lots of there's stigma still associated with hemp. The fact that it's controlled by the Home Office. It's covered under the um, firearms and drugs uh, sector of the of the Home Office. At least some interesting and amusing conversations around licensing, uh, as we all as we all know. Um, but th those sort of changes are going to have a, an enormous impact uh, on our ability to supply and our ability to change the economy as well. Here, here, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, I think uh, as as we can tell, I mean, there's there's certainly. Uh, the consumers and industry and obviously farmers um, are very well aware of the benefits of hemp. Um, we do have a conversation to continue to have with regulators and Nick is, is no, uh, uh <laughs> no stranger, exactly. Uh, there, there's, uh, he's been, um, yeah, certainly kind of uh, yeah, doing, doing the hard graph for many years. So I think that's uh, yeah, really impressive. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, at that point, I, I guess, yeah, if we hand some questions over to the, the floor, if that's okay. I think we've got a few, few minutes for questions. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Um, right, two or three questions. Uh, Regen Farmer, can the product be direct drilled? Second part, if you're uh, removing the product, so you're remo removing the carbon, does it actually build soil carbon? And thirdly, I don't apply phosphate and potash anymore, so if it's taking all that off the field, would I have to replenish the phosphate and potash? Um, direct drilling. We've tried this year uh, direct drilling into a terminated cover crop, and it doesn't like it. Uh, if we talk to hemp, who are the big the big uh, hemp producers in France, then they're all about uh, full cultivation, onion-like seed beds, onion beds if you like. Um, so it's uh, it's th there's work to be done. I think the strip tillage would be would be good enough. It it doesn't like as it's, as I said before, it's a very very weak at coming out the ground and getting established. Um, once it's there, its root taproot will grow through virtually anything, but it doesn't like compaction around its initial rooting zone at all. Um, we've, uh, I think we've had problems um, rolling crops in in the past, and it's maybe just been a little too damp, and it's just prevents it coming out the ground. And it only wants to be 10 mil deep. If you get 20 mil deep, it's probably too deep. It's uh, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, but if you get it right. It just yeah, three months, four meters top. Um, what was your next question? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, you take it all away, but you start and you store that carbon in either buildings or cars or um, various other other things. Um, it's got a tremendous uh, root network because it's three, four meters tall. It needs a big anchor to hold it down. So it's got some fantastic roots. I have just had um, part of this CHC times three trial. I've just had the, um, the Dumas soil carbon test done on the field and it's over 6%. And that's, that's had hemp every other year for about, yeah, however long we've done that now, 12 years I would think. Um, and then your potash, the P and K question, I don't apply any P and K. We stopped applying P and K when we stopped growing spuds in 2007. We only ever applied it for the potato crop. We get all our P and K from 
the pig manure, all our cereal straw goes to our neighbour and comes back, and our indices are still rising. Uh, but it's not particularly hungry on P and K. So Can I, we, we've direct drilled it into sprayed off grass. Uh, we had mixed results. Um, I think it's what, what, what's happened to the, the soil in the past really, isn't it? It's if, it, if it's, yeah. if it's there, if it, if it's there to be grown into, it will grow into it. But if you've got, you know, something that you've really haven't tilled for years and years and years, I mean, pretty much everything struggles in that sort of environment and hemp's no different. Very dependent on soil type as well. If it's if it's too if it's quite heavy, then you're going to have to create a, a well-tilled slot for it to grow in. Is that on? Yes. All right. Well, my dad's asked all the farming questions. I'm going to ask some in more of the industrial side of things. Um, we've mentioned food and building. Is there any other? industry you know for example like fuels or plastics we can make ethanol and and the likes uh, any interest in that or in this country or or worldwide or is it just not worth it yeah. um it it has been said that anything made out of petroleum or timber can be made from hemp there is the multitude of uses um, as you saw that that fiber uh, that that was passed round I mean, clothing is another enormous market that um, is being worked on. Uh, the, the the little bag of fibre that's that's hemp fibre that's been through a, another process to cottonize it. And at the moment, they're trying to mix 55% in with cotton into jeans wear. But th there is all all sorts of clothing. The Future Fashion Factory in Leeds are looking at um, producing clothing. Um, who else is there? English Fine Cottons are looking at doing something with hemp and flax fibers so yeah it's uh, there is um, other industries that it uh, it is potential in there's biochar from the hemp hemp can be used to make the batteries in the gigafactory because it's it holds as much energy as graphene at a fraction of the price and within the composite space I mean you mentioned he hemp plastic um, but within Europe, uh, hemp is being used in various different uh, auto construction, um, and it's being used because it's lighter and stronger. So there, there's an incredible tensile strength. It's a hollow fiber, uh, so you're getting weight reduction. So a large part, I think, why the American um, recently actually the passed the farm bill. So they started growing hemp back in 2018 because the, the auto manufacturers were looking at what is going on in Europe and how do we compete? How do we compete in that market? Uh, and now they're growing fiber for for construction. So, um, yeah, within bioplastics, there's yeah mixtures of 70% hemp with uh, PPE uh, uh, PLA. Sorry, um, so that it's it's getting there. Um, there there are various different applications for that. I mean, hemp plastic is yeah a good opportunity. But yeah, within bioethanol as well. Yeah, you're right. Hello, thank you for your panel. My name's Arizona Muse and I have a charity called DIRT and uh, this is more of an invitation than a question. One of the things that the charity is working on is we are working with a certifying body called Demeter to create new certifying standards for all the fashion materials that don't exist yet within that certification realm. And so hemp is of course one of the things that we are going to be working on soon. And I just wanted to invite all of you to keep an eye out on that certification as it develops. And we'll be forming working groups later on in the year to roundtable discussion out how to grow, process, and also end of life, uh, dispose of the, the textile, essentially, in a way that doesn't harm people or the planet, and how to do that in the way that supports the farmers the best and that supports the processors in the best way. Because the last thing we want to do is make life even more difficult for farmers and processors. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Got one here. Um, question a bit more on the construction, construction side of things. Um, with the installation, is it comparable in terms of U-values and things like that, or does it require more depth? 
um, and the same on the, the sort of hempcrete side of things. You know, is there any benefit or loss in terms of the amount of space it takes up to get the same uh, you know, heating requirements, so insulation requirements? Yeah, I'll go first. Great. Really good question. Um, so, uh, yeah, hemp has got great thermal performance. It's about like for like with glass walls, rock walls, things like that. At the, l at the sort of worst end of the spectrum, we're working it all the time to improve that. So that's why we're not just all about hemp. We add flax, which has got slightly better thermal performance, but it hasn't got the durability of hemp. So um, that's for us a bit more engineering is needed this summer, and then we'll be able to really compete pretty pretty well. So even with our uh, startup equipment, um, we're we're within that range. And I think just to add on that, in terms of hempcrete, which is different from hemp fiber. Um, I would say this is a bigger question across the industry and things like Grenfell have shown the dangers of using products that we've accepted as standard. One of the things I love about hemp is the fact that from the DPC damp proof level up to the roof, there's zero plastics in that wall. And you know, these are things that even as a structural engineer, you're not taught about the realities of microplastics and the actual impact upon your life. Um, we should mention Harrison Spinks, who are also a massive supplier and producer. They produce hemp mattresses and beds. You know, the idea of th some of the products that we're sleeping on top of that, you know, historically no one's even thought about this stuff. People are starting to become aware to the fact that this is not healthy. So I think there's a lot of noise in construction and this industry that is really negative because, as Sam says, we're holding certain things as the standard and that standard's crap. So let's just wake up to that and move on to what do we actually want in the future and decide from there how we're going to build today. It's the wrong way around and it's the same with new values and EPCs. That's being driven by a certain agenda. We're doing testing with Cardiff University to prove that actually although you've got um, a lower U value from products like this or hempcrete relative to Petrochem, you're actually performing better because you know a solid wall construction with thermal mass take overheating that's a massive plus that you don't get from um, petrochem insulation and all of these new builds that are going up they've all got overheating issues things like hemp are the genuine solution and that's not my opinion that's the stats that's the science it's nature's solution to what we should be living in that's a clap isn't it that's really <laughs> <laughs> Can I just go back to um, the questions about bioplastics and hemp plastics? I think the biggest problem is uh, just a chicken and an egg. Um, we need more pressure on the government to show that this is a viable industry. At the moment, there's these guys are really the heroes of the hemp industry. They're innovating all the time. They're growing, they're trialing, they're getting knocked down, they're getting up again. And if we had um, more um, pressure, more industry pressure, more farming pressure, that this is a crop that's really needed right now, that actually is a crop that can really help the government reach its net zero targets, that it's a carbon sequester as well as creating products that uh, don't cost the earth, that biodegrade, then actually we're going to see change. It's almost there, we're close, but um, the and DEFRA are really interested in taking it on, but it needs more farmers involved, more farmers getting involved, having more of a say in it to actually show that there is um, a real appetite for hemp. I mean, Europe is way ahead of us, Germany, France. We are literally, I think, the only country in the world that still has it in a home office. As uh, within the Home Office as a homeland security issue. Everyone knows now that it's an agricultural crop, an environmental crop, and uh, these guys are really spearheading it, but what we need to see is a lot more um, uh, enthusiasm from the farming industry to actually show that there is a real appetite for moving this agenda forward. And hopefully next year we can show with the STEFRA project that we're doing, um, showing the high carbon cropping potential of hemp, that actually the Home Office will finally give it back to DEFRA and then we can get investment and the biggest the biggest problem is the proceeds of Crime Act that is really stopping the investment the banking pathways once that all goes bioplastics and all the other potentials can get unlocked um, and then we can really see this industry fly here in the UK. Have we got one one more question? That, that's great thank you. Yeah, it was just a question about uh, retrofit. Um, you know, retrofit's a pain in the neck. It's complicated, and so I wonder if you've got any experience of, of using hemp products in retrofit. 
Yeah, I'll talk quickly to that. Um, a absolutely, retrofit f hemp is perfect for for retrofit, really, uh, especially traditional buildings, because um, it's again some of those pro you know, thermal mass helping with that um, overheating issue, um, also with the breathability that stone buildings need in particular, uh, and alongside timber too. So it really is good if you're swapping stuff out especially into an older building. In newer buildings, helping with the breathability, mold and damp issues we've got in a lot of the homes. Um, that's all around cold spots and where you've got a lot of slumping in the walls. So hemp is really cracking because it doesn't slump in the walls, for example. So when that's refitted, it's, it's very, very good and can turn a building back to being healthy. So we're working with a lot of retrofit installers. The government um, uh, funding as well, eco, uh, eco funds and so on um, uh, that's available. We're going through the motions right now with a utility that I can't name to help ma make sure that that sort of stuff is available uh, and, and can be funded as well. Because one of the issues is, is price point. We're trying to compete with the glass walls and things like that, where, where their price point's a lot, lot lower at the moment. Um, but that theirs is coming up quite quickly, uh, whereas ours is, is coming down a bit. And if we can be helped by the government innovations funding and carbon, then it's it should be more available for people to afford uh, in the market. So we should see that changing. And more installers as well. We need lots more installers to help out with the retrofit um, uh, world. So there's some exciting innovation happening. So give it a year and it will be really available. But um, happy yeah. to discuss after. And there's one, there's a company called Adaptivate who are in Bristol and they make uh, a hemp plaster. They're bringing the first sustainable hemp plaster board to the market. But I live in a stone cottage in Wales and we had gypsum plaster on the wall cement render on the outside and i did this this year i removed the internal gypsum but not the external so it's no longer it's still not a breathable building i applied 20 mil of the adaptivate plaster on the wall and up till this whole year i've had a black mold issue and that has completely removed it and i know it's worked because my ikea wooden shelves against the wall the mold is grown back on but it hasn't grown back on the plaster so it's 100 percent a solution and it's out there already but look up Adaptivate because they're right at the forefront you're probably from there aren't you <laughs> <laughs> you're Tom's dad aren't you <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much to all the panelists today I think uh, yeah I mean yeah give a round of applause um, yeah.